afternoon and welcome to the March Ford Pinellas board meeting. Uh, please stand for the invocation and pledge. Um, this invocation will be given by Vice Mayor Reed and stand for the pledge after. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Okay, here we go. Let's just start this day over again. So <laughs> thank you for uh, taking a moment with me to say thanks to the Lord for us being able to be here and hopefully he keeps his hand over us to make the right decisions not in a personal way but what is best for the people that support us thank you for all of our wonderful staff and everybody that is here today and god bless All right. First, I'd like to say I'm going to um, invite uh, Commissioner Michael Smith. I'll be leading the, the meeting tonight as vice or tonight. Um, <laughs> used to my own meetings. Uh, today, uh, Commissioner Long is running behind and might be here a little later. Um, so we may be swapping out depending on when she gets here and how she wants to uh, run the meeting. Um, also, I'd like to say, please, when you're saying, uh, introducing yourselves or talking, please turn off on the mic and turn it off, uh, or the staff will be directing you to do it, and I, would, I don't want that to happen. All right, let's start going around in, in, introductions. Want to start over here, Commissioner? Uh, okay. Brian Scott, Pinellas County Commission, District 2. Uh, Councilmember John Muhammad, City of St. Petersburg, District 7. Hi, Councilwoman Patty Reed, City of Pinellas Park. Councilor Chris Burke, City of Seminole, representing the inland communities. Council Member Richie Floyd, District 8, St. Petersburg. Jared Buckman, Vice Mayor, City of Oldsmore. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council, representing PSTA. Al Johnson, Mayor, St. Pete Beach, uh, representing Bear, Big Iron, the Big C. Thank you. David Albritton, Council Member, City of Clearwater, and Ford Pinellas Treasurer. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Whit Blanton. I'm the executive director, and I understand uh, Mayor Buchowski is on her way and will be here shortly. And, uh, Commissioner Michael Smith, City of Largo, Vice Chair. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, Tina, is there any uh, citizens to be heard today on the agenda? No, sir, there is not. All right, uh, moving on. Um, we're going to start with the uh, Whit with uh, a recognition. Yeah, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Kyle Simpson of our staff in the back of the room. We have uh, a pretty uh, big event uh, tomorrow. It is our Bike Your City event, and it's in recognition of Florida's Bicycle Month, which is held every March. And Bicycle Month is a recognition of a way to uh, encourage people to get out and enjoy our currently very hot, uh, but, but nice weather that we have this time of year before it gets too hot and too rainy. Uh, and also to recognize that bicycle safety is an ongoing uh, issue throughout all of uh, Florida, but particularly here in the Tampa Bay area and in Pinellas County. Um, so we have had this event for a number of years now. We'll see if we can top uh, the record number of attendance we had last year in Gulfport, where I think we had about 150 people participate and even got Mayor Kennedy from Indian Rocks Beach on a bicycle. So she was um, a star that day. Um, but we are going to be touring Oldsmar's trail network and taking some opportunities to highlight uh, some opportunities, some issues, and um, ways to improve safety in the Oldsmar area as well. Um, so that'll, that'll event will be tomorrow morning beginning at 7.30, and it'll be a pretty leisurely six-and-a-half-mile tour uh, through the um, uh, city's trail network, and we'll be escorted by the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. Any questions about that? No questions? All right, moving on to Ford Pinellas Community, uh, the Community and Service Day. Yeah, so um, we're going to have a few pictures here that our staff took, but um, on President's Day, we typically have an in-service day where we uh, work together to do something good for the community that uh, tries to align as best it can with our mission uh, as an agency. So we were um, uh, engaged with Hope Villages of America in Clearwater to assist with food distribution, uh, and also help with cleanup of their property uh, at the Oaks. And um, I think our staff really enjoyed it. It was, it was lovely weather. It was a bit of hard work uh, for, for some of us. Uh, we definitely sweated out there, ripping up some leaves and pressure washing, but I think uh, everybody got something out of it. We had a nice thank you note uh, from them afterwards. We helped with the food bank and distributed food as well. Um, and we look forward to those opportunities uh, every year for in-service day. 
if uh, any of you has a suggestion for what we might do in the future or next year, um, it took us a while to identify this uh, opportunity, and I would welcome any thoughts or suggestions that you all might have uh, to us. Um, and I just want to note to staff, thank you uh, to, to get out there and, and, and participate is a, a, a cool thing. Um, it, it's so nice. Oh, and something I'd like to maybe add with is maybe in the future, when ideas come from the board members or in, anybody, um, maybe inviting the board members also to participate would be a cool thing to do also. That's a good idea. Um, all right. Uh, moving on to the next is the consent item. Uh, we'll handle the consent item. Do any board members wish to pull an item from the consent item to be handled individually? No? All right. Uh, Tina, let's see. Just need a motion. If there's members of the public who wish to say anything on the consent item. No, sir, there's not. All right. Uh, what did you say? Just need a motion. I need a motion to approve the consent docket. Move approval. Second. A uh, motion and a second. All right. Um, all, say, all in favor say aye. 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 I'll impose. All right. Item passes. Moving on to the next item is action items. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, presentation action items. First up is P PSTA action uh, report from Council Member Driscoll. Thank you. The PSTA board last met on February 22nd, 2023. Here are some of the highlights. Um, the board approved the extension of free fares on the Sunrunner for an additional six months so that new users can continue to try the service without barriers and also so that we have a full year of data to compare to once the fares are implemented at the end of that time. On the community bus plan contract, the board voted to approve a contract with Jarrett Walker and Associates to develop the community bus plan, which forms the foundation of the transit development plan and the transit component of the Ford Pinellas Long Range Transportation Plan. For our um, spring break promotion, we received a presentation on the services which have begun and include the Clearwater Beach Park and Ride and a sunset serenade on the Sunrunner, which is taking place this evening at 4.30. Um, PSDA, P, PSDA's next board meeting will be held on March 29th at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Any questions from the boards or comments? All right. Um, yes, Mayor. Just a quick question. When you're Gina. going, when you're going, uh, Gina, through your uh, bus, you know, your bus plans uh, as you move forward with that, are you all discussing um, tourist related transit at all? I know you're limited funding. I know your limited funding situation, but does, is that being reviewed or discussed at all? I don't know if it's, if it's reviewed as its own category, but um, I'm, sh I'm pretty certain that, that that ridership would be included in the study that we're doing or the plan that we have. Right. And I, I'll just say it. And I, I, I mean, I think I can speak for most of the cities on the, on the board, but I am currently just speaking for myself, but I do think it's important that when we're making transit plans that we, we do consider not just what we have, but the few, what we're going to need, given that we're investing so much in marketing our county and bed tax and all of that. Um, of course, we have to find the funding, and I, I understand those challenges, but. Right, right. Well, thank you. I'll make sure um, that, that that gets passed along. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? <clears throat> I'll just mention that uh, at next month's meeting, we've invited PSTA staff to give a presentation on the first six months of the Sunrunner to cover not just ridership and what they're planning for the new station, but also safety uh, and the effects of the uh, signal uh, prioritization that's in place for that quarter for, for bus priority and, um, and any mobility effects uh, in the First Avenue corridor. So um, look for a fairly comprehensive report uh, on the first six months of Sunrunner next month. All right, thank you, Whit. Um, Commissioner Long has shown up, Chair Long, and uh, she's <laughs> leaving me in charge of this, so we'll see how well I can keep going. <laughs> um, all right, next up is item B, uh, 6B, Re Regional Activities Report. I'll go ahead and cover this item, and uh, later on in the agenda, we've got a, a little bit more of a topic uh, on this discussion, but I wanted to let everybody know that on March 24th, we will have our next Transportation Management Area Leadership Group meeting. 
Uh, it will be at uh, 9.30 in the morning, and it's at a location in Pasco County. Uh, we rotate the TMA leadership group meetings between the three counties of Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Pasco, and that is our mechanism for uh, regional transportation co coordination and setting regional transportation priorities. Um, as you know, we have three separate metropolitan planning organizations for the urbanized area, and the um, TMA leadership group has been acting in this role uh, since about 2014 or 2015, but before that, there's a long history of the uh, MPO Chairs Coordinating Committee that dates back to the 1990s uh, that has coordinated transportation uh, projects and, and data and analysis across the, the, the region. That is a larger group that includes the MPOs from Hernando Citrus, Polk County, Sarasota Manatee, as well as the three core MPOs. Um, the meeting on the 24th will be just the three core MPOs, and the topic of that meeting will be to discuss a potential uh, consolidation or merger of the three MPOs into a single metropolitan planning organization. Uh, we have three appointed members to serve on that, uh, that board, but uh, any Ford Pinellas board member is welcome to attend and participate. Um, we are encouraging all of our board members to be there in person rather than participating virtually. Um, however, we will allow for the public uh, to uh, raise any comments virtually and, and watch the meeting as well. Um, that will be probably the first of many steps towards a potential merger of the MPOs, um, and it would really need to start there um, and see if we've got some consensus. One of the items that will be on the agenda is a draft uh, memorandum of understanding that I have prepared and I've shared with the staff of the other MPOs. I've incorporated a couple of comments, um, and I will share that with you as soon as I'm confident that we have a draft that's ready to go to the TMA leadership group. But what that MOU does is it spells out a timeline, it spells out um, some key um, uh, needs and requirements for establishing and standing up a new MPO. Uh, and, and one of the points I really wanna make about that is that um, if you wanna receive federal funding from the US Department of Transportation, whether it's for planning dollars or for project uh, dollars to advance, say, the Howard Franklin Bridge, uh, you will need to have a certified MPO that meets all the requirements of a federal government for an MPO. And um, that may take a few years, but this MOU uh, would be our commitment to moving down that path. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get that MOU signed this year and demonstrate that we're going to be working toward that outcome. I don't know how it went today, but I understand the Hillsboro TPO, our counterparts over there, had this on their agenda this morning for discussion. And um, I look forward to getting some feedback on, on how that went. And that's the major item I have on regional issues. We do have the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council Resilience Summit that is coming on May 4th and 5th. And um, I'll be a participant in that as well. Uh, and I'll probably have a little more news on that at the April meeting. Yes, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, with the comments that you just made, Whit, I just want to put on the table that I just came back from D.C. last night, and one of the folks that we met with yesterday morning were the people uh, at the FDOT agency who are in charge of interlocal government relations, and their message was they have money, they have money to spend, and they are very anxious in the projects that we have that are potentially ready to go. And I'm talking, there's one tranche that's got about $3 billion in it. Unfortunately, I lost my notebook on the plane, so all of my precise notes are missing. Talk about feeling like I'm, you know, a little overwhelmed. That said, they were very quick to remind us that there's a finite window. So your agenda doesn't match with the reality of where we are today in terms of taking advantage of some of these pots of money that are available. And so if I could encourage anything, it's that we step up the pace a bit to get the first steps done. And would you please uh, remind me, because I was taking notes and I forgot the date that you said that meeting was, that you thought it would be important for us to show up? March 24th. March 24th. And where is it going to be? Do you know? Uh, I don't have the exact location on the top of my head. Chelsea, do you know? Starkey Library. 
Starkey Library in Pasco County. Oh, lovely. <laughs> it's a big region. Is Commissioner Starkey hosting us with lunch and all the festivities? She is. Yeah. Okay, very, more to come on that. I'm yes. sure you'll let us know. We will make sure all the board members are aware of the meeting location and time for anybody who wants to participate in that. And secondly, because you tend to be in the know about a lot of things going on, is there a group or one of the agencies involved in public transportation that is even beginning to talk about, oh my goodness, what do we do when Brightline pulls into Tampa? Because if you haven't noticed and you've traveled from here to Orlando, they're building those tracks right now. And we're soon to have the Howard Franklin bridge completed that does have an envelope in there, though they can't take the Brightline train because it's too heavy. What are we talking about to replace that to get people who get off that train in Tampa and want to come over here? That is a nightmare waiting to happen. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, that Thank has you. been a, a big topic of conversation. And um, just to update all the board members and the public, uh, Brightline is currently, there's a duck in the room. <laughs> if you're a fan of Bugs Bunny cartoons, it's rabbit season, not duck season. Um, <laughs> So um, Brightline is under construction with uh, the train high-speed rail from West Palm Beach to Orlando, and that will be open and operating, is my understanding, in September of this year. Uh, it's mostly privately funded operation, operating on the Florida East Coast Railroad, uh, and then it will tie into the Orlando International Airport in September. Uh, Brightline has committed to coming to Tampa after that. My guess is it will probably be four or five years before they're ready to arrive at Union Station in Ybor City, which is where I think the station will be. Um, they're, um, I don't believe that they have the ability with that particular configuration and mode to take the train into Tampa International Airport, for instance. Um, so we do need to figure out how to make that connection. The St. Petersburg Chamber of Commerce, I believe, has taken an action. I know their transportation committee took an action last month to uh, make a request of the Florida Department of Transportation to work with us and all the stakeholders in Pinellas County to um, identify a project and fund a project that would uh, make that connection to Pinellas County. What that project is, I can't tell you because that would have to be something we would explore with, with PSTA, with FDOT, and potentially with other partners as well. But there is certainly interest, and um, I think that's something that we're going to be very focused on over the next couple of years. 2028 will be here before you know it. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, any other questions or comments from board members? Uh, Commissioner Long, can you turn off your mic? All right, moving on to the next item, uh, uh, 6C, uh, Complete Street Funding Recommendations, uh, pre presentation by Kyle. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Kyle Simpson for Pinellas Staff, the Active Transportation Planner. And I'm going to discuss our uh, 2022 Grant Cycle Complete Streets program. So just a little overview on this program. It's currently in the seventh year. Uh, we set aside $100,000 for concept planning applications and a million for construction projects annually. Uh, and it's to increase safety and accessibility for all modes of travel, as well as leveraging our transportation dollars for transformative land use change within the project corridors. So this round, we received three concept planning applications. Those included uh, from the city of Largo, the city of Pinellas Park, and the city of St. Petersburg. And I will get into more detail on those. Um, from the city of uh, Largo, we got the Clearwater Largo Road Multimodal Safety Improvement Project. So this actually builds upon a uh, existing capital project they have planned. Uh, and it's from uh, West Bay Drive down to 4th Avenue Southwest. There's a Publix on the west side of the road and people that live on the east side, so they walk across the road. Uh, there's been safety concerns, so they're installing a uh, crosswalk that will be protected in a way, either with a pedestrian hybrid beacon or a traffic signal. Uh, and so doing outreach for that project, they met with the elementary school that's just south of that corridor, and they asked to incorporate the elementary school into that project because um, right now it's kind of uh, the cross-section is built out, the right-of-way 
is sidewalk right of way line, sidewalk right of way line. So um, trying to make it a safer situation for the students. Um, so they've been working with, uh, Largo has been working with Pinellas County since they own Clearwater Largo Road. Um, and this application would look at potential treatments uh, to make it safer and more comfortable for students and community members. So it would uh, take the project limits from 4th Avenue south down to 8th Avenue. Um, and it's also part of the West, Ray, West Bay Drive Community Redevelopment Area. And it would be supportive of multiple goals of their uh, community redevelopment plan. So next from Pinellas Park, we have 60th Street North. Uh, this project would go from 70th Avenue up to 82nd Avenue. Uh, and this incorporates uh, the city's city center district. Uh, this was a plan that was developed in part with funding by Forward Pinellas through a different uh, grant program we have, the Planning and Placemaking Grant. Um, it's within the Pinellas Park CRA and the Pinellas Park Activity Center. Uh, and Pinellas Park really envisions this, this spine being uh, kind of the, the civic and recreational living room. There's a lot of city facilities that exist on this road, as well as a lot of parks. And so kind of tying them together with the first kind of main complete street uh, through Pinellas Park north-south. Finally, we received an application from the city of St. Petersburg for the Skyway Marina District area. Um, the Skyway Marina District plan adopted a few years ago identified kind of the core area of the Skyway Marina District, which is north of 54th Avenue South, and then a south planning area, which is basically south of 54th Avenue South. Um, and the current trail network is a little disconnected through there. Uh, and 31st Street is somewhat of an alternative to the trail that's on the, the west side of the interstate envelope and US 19 on 37th, but it breaks down. And so this would help uh, develop a preferred alternative for, for what uh, a continuous bike facility would look like and help stitch together the currently disconnected uh, communities on either side of the interstate. Uh, and so for our construction side, uh, we received one application. That was from the city of St. Petersburg for First Avenue South bikeway improvements. Um, again, it would be on First Avenue South. This is where the Pinellas Trail kind of turns into more of an on-street bikeway as it enters downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, and this project specifically would touch 7th Street, 5th Street, and 2nd Street. Uh, this builds upon a recent demonstration or pilot project that the city took with four Pinellas uh, support. It was out of our Safe Streets Pinellas plan that was adopted a couple of years ago to do a, a pilot protected intersection at 7th Street. That's the image that you see here. Uh, we put in um, with kind of plastic curbing and flexible posts uh, a little wedge and that makes uh, people turning right from 1st Avenue South onto 2nd Street a uh, smaller radius so they turn slower. Um, and it increases safety and makes everyone, uh, gives everyone more time to react if a uh, reaction is needed. Um, and so this would expand, make that permanent, so be concrete and also some other geometric uh, improvements and duplicate it at 5th and 7th. The reason 3rd uh, and 4th and 8th and MLK are not included is there's long-term plans to two-way those streets, and so we don't want to do something that would potentially have to be removed when those de design plans are completed in the future. And so this project is within the downtown St. Pete Activity Center, uh, a low income environmental justice area as defined within Fort Pinellas' long range transportation plan and within the in-town CRA. And it's also along Sunrunner. So we formed a subcommittee of TCC members to look at the qualifications of all of these applications. They met in January. Uh, they reviewed, discussed, they felt all of them met the criteria and kind of what we're going for with this program um, and ended up recommending for funding uh, Clearwater Largo Road um, as well as the Pinellas Park concept planning applications. Uh, on the application, we ask for applicants to state their requested or their desired grant amount and then also the minimum amount they could receive and still complete the project. Um, and so with uh, Largo, that was $65,000, and with Pinellas Park, that was $37,500. Um, that's a little bit more than the 100000 we had budgeted, but we're able to absorb that uh, within our current uh, funds available without affecting any other project. Uh, the subcommittee felt 
funding uh, two projects instead of only one would uh, benefit, provide more benefit countywide um, than just one. And so they also recommended funding the City of St. Petersburg construction application at the full uh, requested amount of 461000 I can just add one bit of clarification before uh, we go further. The um, concept plans are our money, our PL money that we get from the Federal uh, Highway Administration, and that's money we have in hand. The construction dollars are programmed as part of the five-year work program, so those dollars would roll into the new fifth year of the DOT work program. Thank you. Uh, so building on that, um, with, uh, if you were to approve this item today, the planning funds would become available on July 1st, 2023 uh, for Pinellas Park in Largo. And then the St. Petersburg construction application will be added to our priority project list and for inclusion in a future uh, DOT work program. I should have read this slide, I guess. Be happy to answer any questions. All right, I'd like to pull it back to the board. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Tina, are there any public comments on this one? No, sir, there is not. All right, pull it back. Any comments or questions from the board? Yeah, Councilman. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Kyle, for the presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, that for construction dollars, a uh, million dollars is set aside a year, but uh, less than half of that was requested. Uh, could you speak about that a little bit? Yep, so we have up to a million available, and uh, it's an open application. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we only received the one, um, and so that's what we're funding. Uh, kind of what to, to Witt said, we, we program our, uh, like, the discretionary funds that we get to fund the planning programs, but the construction, uh, we don't necessarily have it set aside at the time. It's just we put it on our priority list and prioritize it high so that it would be funded in the next DOT work program. So it's not necessarily a million that we have uh, set aside per se. Okay, so I got a couple of questions to follow up on that. So um, since not a million was requested. What's going to happen? Uh, are we at a risk of losing funding, or are we going to allocate that somewhere else? It would go to another project that's on the priority list. Okay. Um, why didn't people apply for? Uh, why didn't more people, more cities, apply? Yeah. Um, yeah, it kind of varies. Uh, like I said, this is the seventh year this program has been. Uh, in operation, and I think this is the first time that we didn't have the full million committed mm -hmm. on applications. I, I don't have a good answer for why more okay. didn't. But. I can try and answer that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think part of the issue is a million dollars is not going to complete your project mm -hmm. in most cases, so um, the lion's share of the funding will be from other sources, probably from local funding source. Mm -hmm. And a lot of cities just don't have a big transportation budget. Uh, St. Petersburg probably has more than most. Pinellas County probably has more than most. But after that, it drops off pretty, pretty good. And so these cities are usually advancing one or two projects every four or five years. They're not advancing a lot of projects into the construction phase at one time. Mm -hmm. So it's probably just the pool's not that big. Mm -hmm. uh, we could also... Um, talk as a staff about potentially adjusting the amounts that we award. Uh, the um, $100,000 and up to a million dollars has been the same amount since the uh, Complete Streets program was conceived in 2017, I believe. And uh, we have talked about potentially maybe um, increasing the planning concept uh, funds and then maybe going up on the construction dollars. But that's something that we haven't fully fleshed out. And we would bring that back to the board for discussion before the next round of uh, call for projects. Yeah, and that, and that was going to be my next thing was that, uh, you know, if, if it's that it's not enough money uh, to do a lot of things for places, um, maybe we have a discussion like that. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Wit. Um, the last thing I'll say about it is, uh, I'll, I guess I'll just be frank, St. Petersburg, uh, I talked to our staff about it, and we, did not, we applied um, for half of the amount uh, on purpose because we wanted to leave some for someone else was literally the staff's thinking this year. Um, any chance that there's still another chance for us to throw in another application before we close out this year? Um, 
I mean, I would say probably not, just because it wouldn't be fair to the other jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just figured I'd ask. Um, okay, <laughs> great. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation and um, the answers to my questions. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Any other members have a question? All right, this is an action item, so I need a motion. Move for a motion. Uh, motion. Got a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. <laughs> item passes. All right. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Oh. I didn't get the Janet motion Long, in the second. Janet Long and, and Richie, Floyd. Richie Floyd. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next item. Uh, 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 item 6D, a draft uh, Ford Pinellas reapportionment. Re 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 yes. Back. Plan, yes, that. <laughs> Chelsea, thank you. All right, hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, this presentation is very much like the one that came before you last month, but there's a lot of information in it, and I know that you all are very busy people, so I just kind of wanted to refresh your, your memory. Um, this item is about our MPO apportionment, and the apportionment is that every uh, 10 years after each census, all areas that have more than 50,000 residents um, have to be desi are designated by the census, and apportionment plans have to be drafted to identify how MPO boards, such as yourselves, um, are going to, um, what the membership is going to be made up of, and then that is then approved by the governor afterwards. So the state law requires that every MPO board have between five and 25 voting members. Uh, MPO, um, they're, uh, sorry, each number is uh, determined based on proportionate population ratio and an agreement among the local governments. Um, and then other provisions include that county commissioners have to make up at least 20% of the votes and rotating seats are permitted. So the proposed changes before you today are a bit different than what you saw last month. We're still proposing that we add a third seat for the city of St. Petersburg, given the growth that's been happening within that city and the proportion of residents within the city of St. Petersburg relative to the other communities throughout the county. We're still recommending that the shared seats be lengthened from two years to three years to allow members who do share seats to have a little bit more time on the board so that they can become more accustomed to or just get a little bit more comfortable with how we uh, operate here. The North County seat that, was, that is shared by Oldsmar, Safety Harbor, and Tarpon Springs, we're proposing that that be retained as such. And then we're still proposing that we split the inland community seats so that no more than three governments are being represented uh, or sharing a seat so that they all have equal time to be able to come back around in the rotation. And we feel that this is a little bit more fair. Um, that way, anyone who's sharing a seat, it's only three local governments. We're not proposing that there be different numbers of governments sharing seats um, throughout Pinellas County. So all of those shared seats, again, the length in terms will be three years instead of two. And then we're also like to require that one of the BCC representatives, one of the representatives from the Board of County Commissioners, be from an at-large district. And that way we're making sure that there's a little bit more spread of representation for who is sitting on the board. That'll bring our membership to 15 total members as opposed to the current 13. We like to keep that odd number because we don't want to have any votes that may end up in a tie. And when we look at the, the percentages uh, for the inland communities, before it was 5% of the population, when all six governments shared the one seat, with this split, it'll be about 2.5% each of the total uh, population. Uh, and then the North County seat has about 6% of the population uh, under its representation. Oh, there you go. Uh, this is just another one of those uh, breakdowns of those percentages. Um, so the considerations are very much the same as we presented last, uh, last month. The current shared seats have two-year terms, which really with the learning curve and getting all up to speed on federal and state law, it, it's quite steep. Uh, so by lengthening the term to three years, we feel it gives those uh, members that are sharing seats more of an opportunity to get comfortable in the role. Uh, the city of St. Petersburg, again, their share of the population is increasing. And the Board of County Commissioners, uh, while the percentage of the unincorporated population is decreasing, that percentage is still pretty high. And that's why we felt like requiring that one of the BCC seats be from a countywide representative, it might make it a little bit more equal. So today we are seeking your action on the apportionment plan as presented to you today. We've been drafting uh, resolutions uh, resolution templates that we will be sending out to all of the local governments within Pinellas County following today's meeting. We're gonna be obtaining their support for this, uh, for this apportionment plan over the summer. And then in October, we're gonna be bringing this back to you for final action, and then we'll present it to the governor for approval. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, 
went to the board. Uh, Tina, are there any citizens to be heard? Yes, there are two. Uh, Mayor Costa from the city of Tarpon Springs and Vice Mayor from the city of Tarpon Springs, Craig Lund. All right, you guys ready? Come on up. Mayor? You think Good afternoon, Mayor? everyone. I haven't uh, seen you since uh, the workshop. Try to say, state Just my name. I want to make a question. Uh, is three minutes good enough for you? I, I think so. If not, it won't go much beyond that. Okay. All right. Um, That's why I just want to check. Thank you. I'm uh, Costa Vaticotis, Mayor of Tarpon Springs. Um, I'm here to uh, request the uh, consideration of getting our own seat, and I've got reasons to make that request. Um, on this presentation that you just saw, I noticed where the inland communities were split from five into two, and you see the percentages of that, 2.7 and 2.3. I assert that Tarpon Springs has got as much population as 2.7 and 2.3 to rate its own seat as well. If you take a look at our population of uh, 26,000 compared to the total population for each of these uh, um, inland communities uh, as far as how the seats are split. Um, we were, I, before I get started, I want to uh, introduce a couple of people. Uh, we have with us today uh, from Tarpon Springs, Vice Mayor Craig Lunt, Commissioner Mike Eisner, and Commissioner Paniotis Kulias. So this is an important issue to us. Um, we were recently surprised twice. Um, one, we received uh, an email from uh, Vice Mayor Buckman, who's our representative, that uh, giving us a a heads up that we may be considered for our own seat. And um, I very much appreciate that communication to us. And so that's the last we heard on this matter. Um, later, we, um, uh, as a matter of fact, over the weekend, I received an email from our city manager telling us that that's not the case and that um, not only are we gonna retain the three seats, uh, I'm sorry, the three cities sharing one seat, but that's been extended from, or at least the recommendation is to extend it from two years to, um, to three years. Um, we've not been asked about that. Um, I think if you look at your package, uh, you're gonna be looking a little later at resolutions from each of the communities uh, supporting this change. I can't tell you that the change that you're recommending for Tarpon Springs from two years to three years is gonna work. We work on two, we work on three year terms and we're term limited uh, after two terms. And I would have appreciated to have been brought into that conversation uh, before where we are right now. We, um, we, we created a resolution based on uh, uh, Vice Mayor Buckman's email to us, and that's before you. It's a unanimous resolution. Um, it gives some reasons as far as why we feel that we uh, should have our own seat. I can assure you it's not prestige. <laughs> We're very much a working board. Each of us are um, on very important uh, non-city boards. Uh, Vice Mayor Luntz, our representative of Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, uh, Paniotis Culias is with our Homeless Leadership Council down south, and then um, Mike Eisner, you may know from the uh, Schools and, and School Safety and Transportation Committee. So let me, um, let me just tell you why we need our own seat. <laughs> Tarpon Springs um, is up against Pasco County. We've got uh, tremendous pressure up there and uh, not a whole lot of help. Uh, both from a technical perspective, advisory, leadership, um, and we have to basically deal with Pasco County on our own. Uh, we uh, recently, about uh, a year ago, actually a year and a half ago, a, a project was approved by the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, I believe it was unwise because we hadn't gone through the entire uh, process of analyzing it in terms of impact, but nevertheless, in transportation impact, Nevertheless, it was approved, and right now we're in court over that project. Um, that project uh, will add about 3% to the overall um, daily count on US-19 in that section. 
And US 19, that section six lanes, it's not eight lanes. It goes to six lanes from Tarpon Avenue all the way north to Pasco and eventually becomes eight after it transitions with some turn lanes. About uh, six months after that, uh, Pasco County um, had an application, which is going through the system right now, of approving a very similar project that's going to add about another 2% of traffic to that location. So within the next couple of years, we're going to have um, 4 to 6% increase in traffic of US-19. You don't need to read the newspapers um, to understand what the problems are that we have with US-19. And um, we don't really have a whole lot of um, uh, ways of dealing with that. Um, and that's where I think that uh, the Pinellas County, uh, Forward Pinellas uh, would help us in that regard. We, we do have a good relationship with Pinellas County, but we also need to, um, to, to have some representation here as well. The other project um, is a, a, a county park, um, the Anclo River Park. That's being privatized. A good portion of it's being privatized by Pasco County where they're adding a 22,000 square foot restaurant at that location. We're the local sponsors. That's a federal designation for the Anclo River. Basically, we are the ones that are responsible for the navigation uh, of that area. But also, this particular project is going to add a tremendous amount of traffic and, and people um, coming to that part of the county. And, and I think perhaps maybe you understand or you've been made aware of some of the improvements that are being planned for Anclo Road in that area. So that's another one that we've actually registered ourselves as an affected party. So we're dealing with that to try and to moderate that project so we don't wind up um, being hurt by it, both in transportation on the river and also in the side roads. And then for Tarpon Springs itself, uh, which is probably the most important, um, we're pretty near build out. We're transitioning from a needs-based economy to asset-based which means it's, we're creating places for people to visit. Tarpon Springs is very historic. Uh, we've got two national registered historic districts. Um, we've got 45% of our area is water. We've got two county parks at, within Tarpon Springs, one at the far end of, uh, of uh, Tarpon Springs, which creates traffic issues within Tarpon Springs. But nevertheless, we're transitioning from development and growth uh, to one of bringing visitors in and placemaking. And so our issues are how do we bring people into town and how do we get them out of town? So it's a little different than, than what you see normally with dealing with traffic on US-19 elsewhere. But what, who has gone through this before are the South Beach communities. And so I would view this as a good way of, of um, uh, gaining knowledge from them through Ford Pinellas of what they had to deal with, what they're dealing with right now, so we don't wind up making uh, the same mistake. Um, we did a complete street, streets program. I think you heard me say something about that uh, at the workshop. And um, that helped us in that regard as far as um, making those types of decisions. So I'm hoping that with a seat on Forward Pinellas, we would have a little closer relationship with you. And, and I spoke to Mr. Blanton earlier in the week. Uh, I know most of you, <laughs> we've met in a variety of different venues. And I understand that Forward Pinellas can help us um, whether we have a seat or not. But, th but the, only, the only observation I want to make is that we weren't asked about this. So I'm not sure. I understand Forward Pinellas can help us. But we weren't asked about this change, and I'm not sure why. And, and I would have hoped that there would have been a little more homework to that. I, right now, uh, as far as the city goes, uh, the matter of a resolution for this would obviously have to be uh, discussed and, and uh, presented to the city commission for approving this change. I can't promise you anything on that. Um, I don't know if anybody else is, uh, I think Vice Mayor Lunt, you're signed up to say something. Um, Vice Mayor Lund's going to say something. I, I can tell you I'm the nicest one of the group. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope I didn't exceed uh, too much beyond the three minutes. So Thank, thank you, Mayor. Vice Mayor?
Good afternoon. I'm Vice Mayor Lott from the city of Tarpon Springs, and I guess I'm not as nice. As, but um, I just basically have some general comments. Um, I watched the last meeting of the Ford Pronouncil Board um, twice, actually almost three times. Um, at the end of the session where you, you were discussing reapportionment, we ended up with Commissioner Long saying, so we have a plan. And that plan at that particular time seemed to be to offer Tarpon Springs their own seat on, on, this, on this board. Um, I'm not quite sure what transpired since then. Um, I'm hoping it wasn't just to keep the number of seats odd. Because if that's the case, then it's not, it's not so good. So some of the things I wanted to come up here and say is, um, I'm not sure if all of you know this, but we're the oldest incorporated city in Pinellas County. We were the first to incorporate in February of 1887. We are literally the gateway to Pasco County. Most traffic, I mean, some traffic can go up East Lake Road into Trinity, et cetera. Most traffic flowing north-south from Pasco County goes through two routes, either Alternate 19 or US 19, both of which are congested, both of which need vocal support to change as they are growing. Um, obviously, we are excited about the possibility of obtaining our own spot on this board. Um, one of the things I looked at was we do this via population count a couple of years after the census is done, which is every 10 years, which probably isn't discreet enough to meet the needs of a county period that's growing as much as Pinellas is, and also a county that's as built out as Pinellas is. Almost all of us are in the position where there's not a lot of land left, we're trying to do whatever we can with what we have to improve and to offer housing, et cetera, et cetera. But our streets are overrun. And I, th I think that's a common theme for everybody from, from St. Petersburg up to Tarpon Springs. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention, and it hasn't been brought up here, is we're actually the, one of the largest working waterfronts in Florida, if not Pinellas County for sure. Um, we bring in over $250 million a year just from our working waterfront. We're in the process of improving that waterfront. Um, over the last 10 years, larger ships, bigger turning basins, that sort of thing. That's definitely going to affect the n amount of industrial traffic that comes in and out, as well as the amount of tourist traffic that comes in and out. Um, so I, I guess what I'm doing here is, is I'm pleading... Uh, for you all to, uh, to maybe reconsider the current position on, on us sharing a seat. I mean, it's not that we mind sharing a seat with, with Oldsmar and, and Safety Harbor. And I, I agree, moving the terms up to three years does give you know, more, more uh, emphasis to a, a learning curve, et cetera. But that means that Oldsmar is going to be there for three years. Safety Harbor is going to be there for three years. Tarpon Springs gets a seat on the board every six years. And, and I don't know if that's adequate enough in, given today's you know, growth and, and problems. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right. I'm going to. Yes. I did sign up. I wasn't sure if the structure that I had to work for. I'll give you two minutes. Or, uh, three, three is good. Okay. Just when you're finished, did you say you already signed up? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Panayotis Kulias. You can call me Peter. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not the nice one on the group. And uh, I got in speaking the truth and trying to represent the city as a whole. Uh, as we touched up on the county border, there's only there's not so many cities or municipalities in Pinellas County that by land, not by bridge or water, is connected to another county. And uh, one would argue that our city, Tarpon Springs, receives the most influx of out-of-county residents coming through our city to come work in other municipalities such as yourselves, where you represent. 
And so, uh, you know, we need our own position at this seat, at this table, and for many reasons. Uh, as we talked about, we, I know Oldsmar likes to think they're the oldest incorporated or unincorporated city, but we're right there with them. And, uh, you know, there's something we're trying to preserve. And I understand that some of your cities, your populations are just, the influx is just increasing. But we all ran on preserving all small town charm. And that made sure that we had land codes that were in place where we didn't overpopulate our city. And we're doing that so we can protect it and any other transportation issues that come in the future. And then here's one more important reason why I think we need our own seat at the table. There was an issue that came up from Ford Pinellas and we had that zero deaths policy that focuses on the minority community and the municipalities in Pinellas County. But it was also for Pinellas, who I respect them in every way, wanted to open up a major lane in our minority community, the oldest minority African-American community in Pinellas County, and that is the Union Academy neighborhood. And so we had to sit there. I took an oath to those community members that I wasn't going to let a big road come through and destroy your small community by 130% of an influx in, in vehicles coming through. That's a small neighborhood, and we need to protect its history, its culture, and everything about the Union Academy neighborhood. So it's important that we as a city have our own seat at the table, because as we, as we represent other cities, uh, they may not understand the intricate uh, issues that come across transportation in Tarpon Springs. And so Ford Pinellas isn't just moving forward in Pinellas, but it's moving forward in and out of Pinellas. And so uh, I would say I understand this is built off of a, a population uh, impact for the seats, but it, it needs to be considered your unique position inside the county itself as well. And so as I would like to end this, um, this comment, I know Vice Mayor Lent said we are the gateway to Pasco County. I don't like to look at it that way. I say we're the northern gateway to Pinellas County because people are coming in here to work. And so please consider us for our own seat. We're at a crucial time right now in our city as, as well as yours in which we have to protect certain neighborhoods, uh, make commuting as efficient as possible, but look out in the best interest of our communities. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm gonna pull it back to the board for any comments or suggestions. Uh, open it up to anybody. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank the speakers for coming out today. I think they laid out their case uh, very well. Um, and as Whit and I spoke earlier, earlier in the week, I thought that the team, Forward Pinellas team, did a, did a nice job of coming up with a compromise, but I was concerned that Tarpon Springs is kind of hanging out there uh, sort of all alone without really adequate representation. And while an even number isn't necessarily the um, um, the perfect scenario, but there are 12 of us here today. So what would the harm be in, in just increasing it to 16 and giving Tarpon Springs a, um, you know, a permanent seat? I like the idea of three-year terms because I think there is a pretty good learning curve on this board, and I think that we should go with three-year terms, but I would propose that we, we accept staff re recommendations, but we add a permanent seat for, for Tarpon Springs. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other members? This is uh, council member. So I guess my question is, um, I know committees generally like to have odd number of members in case there's an impasse or something. It's always good to have an odd, you know, number that can, have we ever had that where we've had uh, wit, where we've had uh, like an impasse uh, or close to that? I can't recall since I've been on, we've had that. I don't think we've had it at the board level, but we had a nominating committee once that went to about 1.30 because we had uh, just, we had four people on the nominating committee and we were deadlocked 2-2. So the meeting was delayed by about a half hour. I've had it at the city of Dunedin when we've had somebody absent. And of course, if you're at an impasse, it fails. Right. So I, I have experienced it several times. I just think it's best practice to have an odd number. I, I, and I, I, don't, agree I don't think I agree it's with that. magical, um, uh, but I think it's just best practice. 
I, I do want to just correct one item from the last speaker. Uh, Ford Pinellas has never advocated for a road through uh, Tarpon Springs. The city of Tarpon Springs applied for a grant from us, and they were investigating through that grant the feasibility of whether that would be a road or some other kind of connection, uh, which has been in their comprehensive plan for a number of years. Um, they came to the decision they made, and that was totally their decision that they made. But that was our grant funding made available to them, uh, and they didn't need to be on the board to do that. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear about that. We did not advocate for a road project. Uh, Commissioner. Um, just because I'm semi-new here, I guess, is, is there a reason to not have them? I, I don't understand the choices of, I've never, like I said, it kind of been here before me. But um, why would you not have them? Is there something that states we can only have this amount of people? Well, we're limited to 25 by state law. So if the board wanted to, we could go a lot larger. Um, I think there's a couple things in mind. One is we're required by the federal government to reflect the population uh, uh, of the county and its local governments in developing the apportionment plan. Um, that is not the only consideration, but is the primary consideration for doing that. And, and we, can't, we can't deviate from that. So we can always add other, um, we can add the school board, for instance, to the board, and they're not based on population. So we have other areas, but in terms of the municipal and county breakdown of voting membership, that does have to be based on population. The percentage, uh, and I don't have the numbers exactly, maybe Chelsea can answer that, but uh, their population is, pretty close to Safety, Har or Safety Harbor and Oldsmar's population, Seminole's population. Um, there are different characteristics between Tarpon Springs and some of those cities, but I would argue that Oldsmar's probably imports uh, as many or more workers from Pasco County and Hillsborough County than, than Tarpon does. So we have a city that is part of that group of three that already represents Northern County, cross county traffic flows. And I think from our staff standpoint, you know, I really feel like uh, our staff is very responsive, not only to the board, but to the local governments throughout Pinellas County. Uh, you know, we've got a, a project in Indian Shores. We've got a project in Treasure Island. I mean, we're working with a lot of these local governments to advance projects, but it becomes kind of a management issue the bigger your board gets. And I like spending time with the board members before the meetings and getting everybody prepared. Um, we have um, avenues for cities to participate through our technical coordinating committee, through our citizens advisory committee, through our bicycle pedestrian advisory committee, uh, through our planners advisory committee on land use issues. So I think there are ample opportunities for folks to be engaged. And at some point we just need to say, this is the size of the board. And all of you represent the cities in your rotation. So if you're uh, the city of Seminole or the city of Oldsmar, I mean, you, you kind of have a little bit of a responsibility to be uh, in communication with the cities. And I do thank um, Commissioner Buckman for providing that communication to Tarpon Springs about this. So that, that'd be my answer to that. Any other questions? Sure. Commissioner Burke? Oh, sorry. Just two comments regarding the discussions. Um, one, I'm wondering if we could add non-voting members for the cities that don't have a seat at the table to vote. But if it was a non-voting member, at least they'd be in the information loop to go to Councilman Floyd's question, we didn't put in for any of those grants because Seminole had no idea. We haven't been here for six years or nine years. Um, so maybe we can think of something like that. And then if we're to refer to Tarpon Springs Point, uh, the Seminole's 1800s when we were founded as a Seminole area, the greater Seminole area is huge. It's almost as, as big as Pinellas Park, almost as big as Largo. So do you, can you go by what's on envelopes to figure out what the population is instead of by city boundaries? You could do that, and then it would change the whole dynamic. I think there's a room for some more discussion on how we choose to apportion these seats. Thank you, sir. Mayor Bowser. I just had a couple of questions. Just, I'm just listening. I, I don't have a total opinion at this point, but... Um, you just sort of did answer this question with, but would you, because I think a lot of people don't know, you, you, you were talking about all those working groups with, and like City of Dunedin staff sits on those working groups, mm -hmm. right? Can you just tell us what those are and how does the working group get made up of like, is it as assumed that uh, somebody, the planner or the whatever person from Tarpon is on that group or? 
like, can you just talk about that a little bit? I just want to make sure we have a clear understanding of how TARPON is involved. It may not be an elected person, but I, right. can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, TARPON Springs has a seat on the technical coordinating committee, has a seat on the um, uh, planner's advisory uh, committee as well. So those are the two where they have a formal seat. Uh, they are both technical committees, so their staff uh, are sent those meeting notices, and they are invited, and they are, uh, and they often do attend those meetings. What do they do at the technical coordinating? The meeting? technical coordinating committee develops uh, recommendations for the Ford Pinellas Board, as does the Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, they review basically everything that's on your agenda, and they discuss it, debate it, and develop recommendations when we have an action item that goes before the board. Do they bring forward problems in their own community? They absolutely do. They come up and that is a forum for discussion and debate. Um, starting at the staff level. Uh, starting at the staff level, but I also want to um, keep in mind that a lot of Pinellas County cities are very small, and so they don't all have the staff that, that right. is able to or, right. or comes to those meetings. So a lot of times we are made aware of issues and needs in the individual communities by resolution of the local government elected officials. So for instance, Indian Shores has petitioned us for a sidewalk on Gulf Boulevard by action of their town council. Um, and, and that's pretty common. I would say that happens fairly often. So uh, there are a number of avenues, uh, not just through those advisory committees. The planners advisory committee that I mentioned is comprised of land use planners. And that's where they deal about growth and redevelopment issues. And uh, you know, Tarpon is certainly growing and has some unique issues because it's um, at the county line. Uh, but I haven't heard a single county, a city in Pinellas County say that they're not trying to preserve that small town character and charm. Your uh, city in particular, yeah. <laughs> uh, Safety Harbor. I mean, this is a very common issue in our community. Uh, Pinellas County has some challenges with growth and development and the built out nature of the, of, of the development pattern. Uh, we are redeveloping. And that redevelopment has to happen in a scale that fits the character of each community. And so everybody's wrestling with those issues. Um, so those committees all make recommendations to this board. Uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee doesn't necessarily have a Tarpon Springs or any particular city seat, uh, but the Citizens Committee has representatives that are geographically based. So there is a Largo area seat, but that person could come from unincorporated area in the Largo area. Uh, mm -hmm. Just same for North County. Uh, they could come from the city of Tarpon Springs, or they could come from Unincorporated or Oldsmar or Safety Harbor. Okay, so Tarpon is being represented is what you're saying. It's yes. just in a different way. So the second question I have is, uh, I think if I remember correctly, PSTA has a rotating seat as well, right? Isn't it Oldsmar, Safety Harbor, and Tarpon? Isn't that the, that, I mean, that's what I seem to remember. Yes. Has that changed at all? No. No. So that's how they deal. So that's the other piece of it, right? So how, how does one affect the other? I, I'm not saying that it does. I'm just. I think it's made a big difference over the years asking. because PSTA has made their board more closely mirror the Ford Pinellas board over the years. Right. And at one point, it's going back eight or 10 years, um, they did not, PSTA did not have the same number of county commissioners, for instance, that, that the MPO had. And I think that was a problem because you didn't have the county commissioners having the insight into PSTA then, but they had the insight in the MPO, and that led to a lot of conflicts. Right. Uh, frankly, we were planning for a monorail system at the MPO, and PSTA had no interest in implementing a monorail system. Um, I never want to go back to those days, so yeah. it was really nice to have um, a pretty consistent membership between PSTA um, and they do a few things differently, but it is fairly consistent between our board seats now. So I believe that you guys, that seat on PSTA rotates every two years, right? Yeah. I think it's a three year rotation. Is it three? I'm not, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I thought we were moving to be consistent with PSTA. Heather's okay. in the and, room. And I'm just, I, I'm just asking these two questions because it's not just us doing this. This is sort of, like you just said, set up to, to mirror the situation. Okay, I, I don't have any, I, those are my two questions. Thank you. Commissioner Driscoll. Thank you. Can you tell us why this isn't done strictly by population in, which is the most objective way to do it and 
as you know assign the number of seats in proportion with the the population for each city or each area and go from there well, rather we, than taking more of a this is almost too subjective well we we do use objective criteria of population to to base the representative representation in but part, we are yes for the most part, the only real deviation is that we have a seat for PSTA on the board. That's not based on population. Um, that is an option. We don't have to do that. If we have a seat for the public transportation provider, then the percentage of county commissioners on the seat is can drop. But if we didn't have that, the percentage of county commissioners would be 25%. Uh, so there are some things in state law that we have to follow. Same thing about the limit, the total number of 25 members. But it is based on population. Chelsea probably ran through those numbers pretty quickly, but that's the basis of those numbers. But it, it's not a strict population. It's, it's sort of like a representation based on the population. Okay. So for instance, what we're proposing is that St. Petersburg have the same number of seats on this board as Pinellas County because your population is essentially identical mm -hmm. within a decimal point or so. And what is the percent, do we have the percentage specifically for Tarpon Springs? Uh, Chelsea would have to bring that information up. She does. Um, so in 2020, Tarpon Springs had 2.6% of the total population of Pinellas County. Comparable to? Uh, Oldsmar had 1.6% and Safety Harbor had 1.8% of the population. And all of these numbers should be on the last page of the apportionment plan in your attachment as well. Okay. Pulling back from uh, council member. Uh, Commissioner Dr Long. Uh, Pete, can you bring you. the PowerPoint back up, please? Thank Hello? Me? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my, my point that I wanted to make here is, and it's a question for you, Whit, really, we're, we're spending on quite a bit of time on this subject matter today. We spent quite a bit of time on the subject matter a month ago, and yet we're in the midst of this regional conversation about having one regional MPO. If you think the seating on this board is complicated right now, my question is, what is that conversation going to look like when we come to creating one regional MPO? There's going to be a lot of folks that are not going to have seats on the board by virtue of the fact that now we're talking about an entire region. So we're going to have to buckle up and combine our resources with a strongest members on our board that we can, right? Is that bad thinking? I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Whit. Well, you're right. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we are you know, beginning those conversations to head down that path. And um, again, we'd be dealing with the 25 total seats for three counties. And um, we'd have to see how that plays out. So my point is, I'd like to see if we can't move on from this conversation, take the recommendations of the staff, and let's see where we go with the new conversation about one regional MPO. It's gonna be right around the corner. I mean, Bamit was supposed to be doing that summit, discuss the whole thing. You'll all be invited to it, I'm sure. And there's a lot more to come. So it seems to me like we're spinning our wheels here on a subject matter that may not even last very long. Commissioner Long, would you like to make a motion? I make a motion. We accept the re recommendations of the staff. Continue as it has been outlined here, since I see a lot of it is based a bit on population. And I think with our commissioners on board, we have representation for the whole entire county. That's my take. I have a motion. Do I have a second? All right, I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh. Sorry, I have one of the questions. <laughs> yeah. Go uh, ahead. Well, a statement. Oh, my God.
and, and I think this was just human error. It's not about this particular thing, but it's about the document, the, the plan. You know, you gave us the red line. Mm -hmm. Under, sorry, I made a note about it. Under uh, the non-rotational seat list, where's Chelsea? Is that who? Where? Under the non-rotational seat list, Dunedin's not listed. I think it's human error. I, I think it's because it was originally proposed in one way and you probably, I just want to make sure we're, we're listed. We were going to sneak that past you. Yeah, I read it. <laughs> sorry, I just needed to get that in. Thank you. Commissioner Long, do you accept a friendly, do you accept a friendly alternative to it? That, that's corrected in the agenda. Just the fix. Yeah. So I, I wish it was me. It no, it's on the presentation. It's not in in, in the red line document backup. Yeah, I, I just did that. That's what he's asking. Are you okay? Okay, and just if I can just make make one comment here. Listening to all the comments, I appreciate the staff's time putting this together. I appreciate the city of Tarpon Springs coming up in support of this. We would also be supportive of this. The way we see this, um, from a population standpoint, I understand to a bit, there's still 2.6% in Tarpon that would almost justify that seat. But to us, exactly what Tarpon Springs is saying, where they're currently in a phase of attracting more tourists, getting more tourists, where we're a specific hotspot for the Teal study, we're looking at employment, we're looking at new development, we're looking at redevelopment in the Safety Harbor, Oldsmore area. So it's completely two different ideas and concepts and thought processes that we're going through from two different cities that are geographically apart and where we're directly butted up against the uh, western side of Pinellas County or eastern side of Pinellas County and the gateway to Pinellas. So um, we would be in support of Tarpon having their own seat. All right. Uh, All the questions. All the questions. <laughs> uh, Commissioner, uh, Council Member Driscoll, do you accept a friendly exception to this. Okay, I'm going to call a roll call vote on this one just to be on the safe side. I thought you might. Thank you. Uh, Richie Floyd. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Vice Mayor restating? Buckman. Tina, you know, hold on wait. real quick. Would you mind restating the motion? I just want to make sure that I'm clear on the motion. Okay. The motion by Commissioner Long is to accept staff's recommended apportionment plan with the Scrivener's error of Dunedin's uh, not being in the plan being corrected. That was seconded by Council Member Driscoll. So it's accepting the plan as proposed by staff, but making the correction to show that Dunedin is in a non-rotating seat. Thank you, Tina. Vice Mayor Buckman? No. Council Member Driscoll? Yes. Mayor Allen Johnson? Yes. Council Member Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Long? Yes. Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Commissioner Scott? No. Council Member Muhammad? No. Vice Mayor Reed? No. Councilor Burke? No. Commissioner Smith? Yes. The motion fails. All right. So someone want to make a Alternate motion. Can I yes. make a suggestion yeah, then? Awesome. If it's failing, then there's obviously some shared concerns amongst our colleagues here, which I totally respect. Um, maybe we go ahead and I don't think we're going to solve it sitting here, all of us going back and forth. I, I would rather have our team, our staff team, take a look at it and debate some of the issues that need to be debated on how to solve it um, and then bring back a bring it back again in April I just I don't want us to sit here and try to figure it out I, I, I can tell you right now I don't like the idea of an even number because it can be a problem and I don't think we should ever set ourselves up for failure and I know that there are other issues that we're not privy to or maybe privy to and don't want to discuss about adding additional seats over and above TARP and to make it an odd number. Um, and then there are other ways of solving it. So 
I don't want it us I don't want to see us try to figure that out. I think the team should bring it back again with whatever that I'm sorry. Whatever that recommended solution should be. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I recounted and I think we only need a simple majority for this right. and it's seven to five. Yeah, okay. Seven yeses and five noes. Okay. So it did pass. It's it only needs a simple majority, so it's okay. seven to five. <laughs> okay. Well the only thing I would kinda add it, yeah, and, and I would just like because there was so so some question about could we include the, the Tarpon Springs, their city managers, and the other cities that are on that, their city manager, the agenda for Ford Pinellas, so they are aware of what's coming aboard, uh, forward, so their city manager can just uh, get the agenda to their members who would like to come and be, you know, just in the audience or something that comes up. I would even go further to say we would welcome citizen advisory committee recommendations and nominations. We've really struggled getting CAC members from the north part of the county. So, so we can staff and y'all no. reach out to them and Absolutely. see? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry to interrupt again. Um, I've already been, me through the gauntlet. I've listening. already been getting text messages from the staff member that directs the CAC asking for the contact information from these commissioners and the mayor and vice mayor who are here today seeking CAC members. So awesome. they were already asking before you all even brought it up. So I just want to point out that. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, since that, we'll move on to item 6E, Gandhi Project, uh, Craig Fox from DOT. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Craig Fox with the Florida Department of Transportation District 7, here to present on the Gandhi Boulevard PD study. First, I'll start with an overview of the limits of the project. They extend from the west and 4th Street North in Pinellas County, northeast over the old Tampa Bay, ending in Southwest Shore Boulevard in Hillsborough County. I just want to quickly review the purpose and need of this study. Uh, the purpose is twofold, is to one, reduce traffic congestion, and the second is to improve bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Now, since uh, around 2016, we had a deficient level of service from 4th Street to the west end of Gandy Bridge, which is in the Pinellas uh, segment of the PDE study, and this only expected to worsen over time. Uh, when you look at the Gandy Bridges and also in the West Shore, uh, the Hillsborough portion extending out to West Shore Boulevard, that does have an acceptable um, level of service in future years. As far as the bike and pedestrian accommodations go, there, there's a trail existing on the north side. Uh, in both the Pinellas and Hillsborough sections, there are no trail accommodations on the Gandy Bridges, and there's sidewalk on the south side, but it's limited, uh, limited, situ li limited areas. We do seek, uh, with this PDE study, to match up with the active transportation plan of for Pinellas, uh, by connecting to the trail ending at 4th Street and Gandy Boulevard and also connecting to the Pinellas Trail Loop at San Martin Boulevard. We're also gonna to connect to a conceptual trail in Hillsborough County at Bridge Street. Now the study is divided up into three main segments. First starting with the one at the top, which is the Pinellas segment that extends from 4th Street to the west end of the Gandy Bridges. The second segment is a base segment, which includes both Gandy Bridges over Old Tampa Bay. And the third and final segment is the Hillsborough segment from the east end of the Gandy Bridges to West Shore Boulevard. Now, Gandy Boulevard is a very important east-west corridor in both Pinellas and Hillsborough counties. It connects regionally to 275 US 19 and the Leroy Selman Expressway. It's part of Florida's strategic intermodal system and also connects to regional centers in both St. Pete and Tampa and is also a hurricane evacuation route. Now I want to quickly review the existing typical sections within the study limits. The first one is the one to the top left, that is the Pinellas segment. It consists of two lanes in each direction at grade, along with the, the multi-use trail on the north side that I mentioned. There's also south, a sidewalk in some areas along the south side, but that is not continuous throughout the whole study limits. There's also a marked bicycle, um, bicycle lane, but that picks up at Brighton Bay and ends at the west end of the Gandy Bridges. Now moving on to segment number two, the bay segment. That consists of two bridges. The one on the right was built in 1975. That is two 12-foot lanes. 
with a 10 foot outside shoulder and a six foot inside shoulder. And the bridge to the left, that one was built in 1996, which consists of also two 12 foot lanes and a 10 foot outside shoulder and a six foot inside shoulder. The third and final typical section, the existing typical section, consists of the Hillsborough portion, segment three. This consists of two lanes in each direction at grade, uh, which is comprised of Gandy Boulevard, and also the, included in it is the Leroy Summit Expressway. Now this Leroy Summit Expressway is managed by the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority, and so we're not making any modifications to that in this study. Now onto the preferred typical sections. Starting with typical section one to the left, it extends from 4th Street to Brighton Bay Boulevard and also from San Martin to east of San Fernando Drive. It consists of two 12-foot lanes, grades separated in each direction, as you can see in the center image of the image on the left, along with two 10-foot outside and inside uh, lanes. Sorry, 10 feet or, sorry, six, uh, eight foot, yeah. Sorry, it's hard to see the numbers across there. Eight foot inside lanes. And then for the frontage roads, you can see those towards the edges of the image. We have two frontage roads in each direction, along with a 12-foot mosaic to use trail on the north and on the south side. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we'll be able to clue a trail on the north and south side of the corridor. Moving on to typical section number two, that goes from Brighton Bay Boulevard to San Martin Boulevard. You can see here we converted from the regular grade separated, what we call an MSE wall, to a viaduct portion. And we did this so that we could tuck the frontage rows underneath. And this was done to avoid right-of-way impacts to the period point apartments uh, to the north. We also, so that we retained the two 12-foot lanes in each direction on the viaduct with 10-foot outside shoulders and 6-foot inside shoulders. We also have the frontage roads, two lanes in each direction at grade, along with a trail on both the north and the south side of the roadway. Now moving on further east to typical section three, this extends from San Fernando Drive to the west end of Gandhi Bridges. You can see here that we actually take the frontage road, one of the frontage road lanes actually merges and becomes part of the grade separated portion. So it extends out to three lanes in each direction in this portion with 10 foot outside lanes and 12 foot inside and 10 foot inside lanes. And then we also have the frontage roads, which is a single lane in each direction around 15 feet wide uh, with a multi-use trail on both the north and south side. Uh, this extends pretty much on the causeway portion of Gandhi Boulevard to the west end of the Gandhi Bridge. Now for the typical section number four, this is over the base segment, I'll start from the right and move to the left. So that 1975 bridge that I mentioned before, that's the bridge which is, which is the existing eastbound bridge. It will be removed as part of the project and the existing westbound bridge in the center will be widened as shown in purple and converted to the eastbound uh, direction of traffic. And then we'll build a new bridge which will become the westbound bridge to the north. So it's pretty much similar to the order of construction that the Howard Franklin is going under right now, which the new bridge is going to the north, and the southern multi bridge will be demolished. So on the bridge segments, you have three 12-foot lanes, 10-foot outside and inside shoulders, and on the northern structure, we have a 16-foot multi-use trail. I do want to note that at the edge, the west end and the east end of the Gandhi bridges, we will include a loop trail uh, that connects underneath the bridge so that trail users on the south side will be able to connect to the north northern trail so that they can, they, they can then cross the bay. Now, the last typical section is typical section number five, and this is in Hillsborough County. This goes from the east end of the Gandhi bridges to West Shore Boulevard. You may notice here that we're actually not suggesting any modifications to the typical section. We're not proposing any widening or right-of-way impacts within Hillsborough County. Instead, what we're going to do is realign the roadway so it matches up with a new alignment of the bridge segments. We are, however, uh, looking to extend and widen and extend the multi-use trail on the north and south, south sides of the roadway so that we'll have a continuous trail connection uh, out to uh, Bridge Street. So at the end of the project, we'll have a continuous trail. One will be able to ride their bicycle in a, bicycle in a trail from West Shore Boulevard all the way over to uh, 4th Street in Pinellas County. So we're very excited about that addition uh, to the segment of road. Now, quickly review access management. We have full median openings located at the following locations, at Brighton Bay and at Mangrove Clay Lane or San Martin Boulevard. This is shown in the image at the bottom right. And this is also the portion that I mentioned that is that we convert to the viaduct. So you can see the period, 
Superior Palms apartment complex to the north. We're avoiding right-of-way impacts that would cause any relocations. We do have a little right-of-way impacts on the right side, but it's not going to uh, trigger any relocations. Uh, so Brighton Bay Boulevard, that is currently a signalized intersection, will be also making San Martin Boulevard a signalized intersection also. And I do want to note that the frontage roads, so you, while we will have signalized intersections, the frontage roads will have substantially less traffic than you do, than you have on Gandhi Boulevard today, because the vast majority of traffic is going to be on the great separated portion, uh, freeing over, pretty much over 90% of the traffic uh, will be free from those frontage roads. So there will be signalized intersections, but a lot less traffic uh, folks will have to deal with. We also have full median openings, uh, various locations east of San Fernando Drive at 1,400 feet, 4,600 feet, and 9,000 feet east of San Fernando Drive. Those are shown in the three images to the left. Um, and they, they start off at the, pretty much at the intersection in front of the getaway, and then extend further east along the causeway, uh, causeway front and crossing number two, and then number three. We also have a 500, uh, sorry, we also have a full median opening 500 feet west of Bridge Street, which is shown in the image at the far right. That is in Hillsborough County. And also uh, at Bridge Street, we also have a directional median. Now currently, uh, that, that, oh, that med full median opening 500 feet west of Bridge Street uh, is pretty good because what it's going to provide is a direct connection into that Gandhi boat ramp. Currently, since the summon extension was uh, completed, uh, Boats and trailers have to, sorry, trucks and trailers, they have to go pretty much in front of the Summit Extend, Summit Expressway, and then do a U-turn, which is, you know, traffic coming off the bridges is, is moving at a pretty good rate of speed. They don't really have the chance to slow down as much. Uh, so we're going to make that connection a lot safer for uh, boats and trailers entering into that Gandhi boat ramp. Now, covering stormwater management and floodplain compensation, there are two proposed stormwater management facilities. The first is, is shown in the left image. That one is an existing pond within FDOT right-of-way. It's located at 4th Street and Gandy Boulevard. We're looking to extend it within the existing project limits. And the second proposed pond is an off-site that will require 1.3 acres of additional right-of-way. And that's shown in the image on the right, located at Gandy Boulevard and Oak Street. And no floodplain compensation is required for this project. As part of the pd &E, we do have draft documents located on the project website. We also have them available at the public hearing, which I'll get into in the next slides. Uh, but we do study things such as the natural resources that covers everything from essential fish habitats to protected species, cultural resources, which looks at archaeological and historic resources along with Section 4F impacts, the social environment, which includes everything from community impacts uh, to park and rec parks and recreation, and also physical environment, covers noise, contamination, and air quality. Now for the estimated project cost, and I do want to note that this is a total cost for all three segments. So it includes the Gandy Bridges, includes the Pinellas portion, and also the Hillsborough portion. So the design is 59, estimated at 59.8 million, the right of way of 41.9, well in mitigation of 1.25 million, and the CEI at 59.8, with construction costs uh, totaling at 598 million, with a total project cost of all segments uh, totaling $761 million. This plan is consistent with both the Ford, Ford Pinellas LRTP along with the Hillsboro TPO LRTP uh, for both, in both years of 2045. Now for the schedule and funding. The study did begin in February 2020. Uh, at that time, we also did begin data collection. Uh, as you were all well aware of, you know, the world kind of turned on its head after February 2020. So we did in, in, you know, incorporate some delays, especially with traffic since you know, there was no traffic to really analyze um, once um, things got going. But we we're able to, to catch up, and the preparation documents is ongoing. Like I mentioned, we have the draft documents available on the website. All of them are draft except for the CRAS, the, the Cultural Resources Assessment, because that was approved by um, the agencies. The public hearing was held on February 28th. That's last Tuesday. I have some more information on how that went on the next slide. And we're anticipating the pd &E approval second quarter of 2023. Now, within the five-year adopted work program, you'll note that we only do have the design portion uh, funded, currently funded in fiscal year 22 and 23. Uh, for the Pinellas segment, the right of way nor the construction uh, phases are currently funded. Uh, the, for the base segment and also the Hillsborough segment, we do not have design currently funded, nor is construction currently funded. 
Now, we did have the hearing, public hearing last Tuesday, February 28th. It was 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And the in-person location was at the Pinellas Park Performing Arts Center, and the virtual uh, component was held via GoToWebinar simultaneously to the in-person meeting. We had a total of 82 uh, signed in on the sign-in sheet in person with 46 attending online with a total number of recorded attendees of 128. So it's a very good turnout. So far, we have received 151 comments uh, via the project website. We received, that says two, but I actually got two more comments in today by mail. So we have four mail comments. We received 10 formal uh, public hearing comments. And uh, there were two additional comments that were made, um, written comments that were made at the public hearing. Comments are still open as the current period does close on March 10th. So that number is expected to increase as we get closer to uh, that closure date. Now here's my project, sorry, here's the project website along with my contact information. Uh, that QR code links directly to the project website. We have in there all the materials that were presented at the public hearing, including the video, the conceptual design plans, the typical sections, along with all draft documents are currently on the project website. Uh, so you can definitely check that out um, you know, for more information. And my contact information um, is on the screen also if anybody does want to reach out to me with any questions. So uh, right. now I'd like to take any questions or concerns. Thank you. So this is an informational item, so it's open to the board. Anybody on the board have a question or comment? Yes, Mayor. I know that Pinellas Park has been working towards this for a long time. Y'all comfortable with it? What's happening? Well, I mean, we've heard over the years comments about it, about Gandhi and you know. Mics, please. David, you too. I mean, I, the mayor has been pretty vocal. Pleasure. Yeah, I mean, about all kinds of transit and, and road issues in that area. So that's what, what I'm, why I'm asking. I'm, I'm just making sure y'all are good. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and Dave's our, you know, our transportation guy, or our, our traffic guy and so forth. But we had a meeting yesterday, and we talked about some of the changes and how we're trying to work in our city getting ahead of everything that's going on with the traffic. And I, I think this is going to be a positive. I, when we talked about it, we felt positive okay. about it yesterday. So thank Good. you, though, for thinking of us, because it does come right, right, right there. It does, and that's why I was yeah. asking. Just wanted yeah. to hear your feedback. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Our, uh, yes, Council Member. Uh, thank you. Mike. I just wanted to ask a quick question. If you could just talk a little bit about um, the connection at 4th Street, uh, that's where I've experienced it backing up the most and with increasing capacity on Gandhi and 4th Street uh, staying the same. I just wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so we actually will have, um, so it's not showing the images that I had on the display here, but we actually are going to have an basically on-ramp to the great separated portion, just a little bit east of 4th Street. We're also looking to modify um, that current uh, uh, that current connect, the, the current connect, oh, there we go. Actually, we do have an image right there. Um, so it doesn't really show the on-ramp in this image, but there will be an on-ramp uh, for that frontage road connection going over uh, to 4th Street. Um, you also have to, have to think that the majority of the traffic is actually gonna be on the existing great separated portion that's west of 4th Street. So they will no longer have to deal with that mer direct merge into the traffic coming. Uh, so the Gandhi Boulevard traffic going eastbound won't have to deal with the direct merge uh, with traffic coming from Fourth Bound, sorry, from Fourth Street, because you'll have the great separated roads, which wouldn't have to deal with that Brighton Bay signal. Um, so the Brighton Bay signal that that offers, of course, of course, an interruption in the flow there. So that will be free flow traffic, which will perform a lot better as far as level of services service services goes. Okay, thank you for the info. Yeah. No All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Have a, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to the next item, six F, Advantage uh, uh, Advantage Alt nineteen, uh, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me today. 
Um, my name is Christina Mendoza. For those of you that don't know me, I am a principal planner with Forward Pinellas. Today I'm very excited to give you an update on a project that we are currently working on entitled Advantage Alt 19, investing in people and places along the alternate US 19 corridor. Uh, but we call it Advantage Alt 19 for short. <laughs> So today I'll start with an overview of our project purpose, followed by an overview of our corridor existing conditions analysis that we're currently wrapping up right now, uh, followed by a summary of our next steps. So I know some of you are familiar with our Advantage Pinellas investment corridor strategy, but for the latter group, essentially our agency worked with our partners at the local jurisdictions as well as PSDA and FDOT to identify nine roadways within the county that best connect key areas that link jobs and housing opportunities, and Alt-19 is one of those roadways. So this project is looking at Alt-19 south from Clearwater down to St. Petersburg, and essentially we're trying to identify what, what types of development exist along the corridor now and what the community would like to see in the future. We're going to use this information to develop a strategy that allows for redevelopment in a way that addresses the community's needs as well as helps to address transportation barriers that exist along and around the corridor so that we can increase accessibility and connectivity to it. Our ultimate goal really is to help provide people with better access from their homes to their jobs and job training opportunities via reliable transportation options, including the opportunity for enhanced transit service. That is something that we are looking at. So here's a closer look at the study area. It consists of a half mile around Alt 19 from State Road 60 in Clearwater to 58th Street North in St. Petersburg. We've also included downtown Clearwater as a context area for the transportation analysis in particular uh, because we know that the Park Street Terminal is a key origin and destination for transit users. Uh, because the corridor is so long, we have split it into four segments. So segment one is down in St. Petersburg, Seminole, and Unincorporated County. Uh, segment two includes Seminole and Unincorporated County. Segment three includes Largo and Unincorporated County. And segment four includes Clearwater and Unincorporated County. So we took a, look, a closer look at the corridor demographics. We learned that the corridor population was about 76,000 people as of 2022. That's about an 8% share of the total county population. When looking at jobs, we learned that there were 30,000 jobs in 2019. That's about an 8% share of the total county jobs. The median household income for the corridor was about 53,000, which is lower than the Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater, Metropolitan Statistical Area median family income, which is about 82,000. When looking at land use, the corridor is primarily made up of residential at about 49%. That's followed by open space and water at 16% and commercial at 15%. When looking at safety, we learned there are about 11,930 total crashes between 2017 and 2021. Of that amount, 575 of those crashes involved a bicyclist or a pedestrian. And while we know that only accounts for about 4.4% of the total crashes, um, these crashes disproportionately result in fatalities or serious injuries. So we know that that is a big concern here. When looking at transit, Alt-19 is primarily served by PSTA Route 18. That is one of PSTA's core transit routes. It also has the second highest ridership in the system. The corridor also includes five direct connect locations. And these allow riders to access discounted Uber, Lyft, taxi, and wheelchair van trips to and from the direct connect locations. We also conducted a market assessment as part of this um, existing conditions analysis. We learned that the corridor supports more than 24 million square feet of multifamily, retail, and office development. Currently, there are about 13,000 multifamily units within the corridor. There's about 8.4 million square feet of retail and 5.3 million square feet of office uses. Looking forward to the year 2032, we see a future demand for an additional 2,350 new multifamily units, 134,000 square feet of food and beverage uses, 48,000 square feet of health and personal care uses, and 173,000 square feet of new office uses. 
So that was just a brief overview of some of the many data points we pulled out as part of the existing conditions analysis. Uh, this is just a quick overview of our study tasks and timeline. We do plan to conduct outreach throughout the entire duration of the project. We're currently wrapping up the corridor characteristics and opportunities analysis now. Uh, we have started the redevelopment vision as well as the implementation and funding strategy. And our plan is to wrap up this project by the end of this summer. So what's next? As I just mentioned, we are starting the redevelopment vision now. This will revolve around the potential for a future transit investment. Um, if you can, I know it's kind of hard to see on the map on the screen, but uh, this is a working vision map that we've identified for Alt-19. Um, it includes opportunities that we've identified for the corridor, um, as well as it overlays with our activity centers. Um, it includes the trail and some multimodal connections that we're seeing. Um, and for the redevelopment vision in particular, we plan to develop stationary profiles for, um, actually it's, that should say 13 locations. Um, so you can see them on the slide, they're black dotted circles. Um, and those are potential station, station area locations that we are looking at. So the redevelopment vision will include information um, such as existing and future land use, redevelopment potential, multimodal connections, infrastructure, things like that. So we're just starting on that now. We're also working on the recommendations and implementation strategies. These will be funding and policy strategies to achieve the redevelopment vision at a quarter-wide municipal and station area level. Uh, we will also be working on refining the enhanced transit service concept. So we're kind of trying to get a better sense of what the transit service investment could look like. Right now, we're thinking it could be something similar to a limited stop express service. So this would be a service that's faster than what's up out there now. It would be more frequent and it would have less stops. So. That's something we're working with PSTA on right now. Also, um, our recommendations will include potential transportation projects for implementation. Uh, we will, it will aid in achieving the mission of connecting people and places countywide. Once completed, the plan recommendations will be presented for review and approval to the board. Uh, and once approved, the recommendations could be prioritized as potential projects for funding. So with that, I'll take any questions. I also will note that we have the consulting team here that's working with us, Kimley Horn, uh, here with us today. If you guys have any very specific questions about the analysis, they're here to help, help me answer those as well. So, All right. This is informational, so it's open for questions from the board. Anybody have any questions? Yes, Mayor. Can we go back? Can we go back to the slide about the what's next and, you know, where you're talking about the transportation investment, you know, looking at enhanced transit service concept and all of that. Um, I clearly understand you're looking at this corridor for and this area of the corridor for a, a reason. So I'm not questioning that and I'm not trying to get you to expand that. But I would say if, if you are doing like a piece of the study that's examining transit, um, I'll say it again, I, I, I need, I would like to see tourism considered, and which would say then if we are looking at the, uh, you know, the possibility of a new, a new uh, station or whatever you want to call it, hub in downtown Clearwater, then I, I think you've got to also look at where those enhanced stations might be north of this area. I'm not saying you got to study that whole area otherwise, but I mean, I think you want to look at it, at least from that perspective, all at once so that you know. And, and that can be a phase two, but I do think it's very important because they don't just stop when it comes to the bus service and the expedited need to get somewhere faster on that corridor goes all the way north through Tarpon, which is, you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. if they were still here, they would agree. Um, no, I mean, the entire corridor is one of our priority investment corridors. So um, this portion of the corridor was prioritized based on a criteria analysis that we did. Right. Um, but and I'm not saying in the future that could be something that we look at. No, and I understand that. I, I know that, and I'm not trying to get you to change it. I guess I'll just look at you, Whit. I, I just think if we're going to start recommending transit nodes. Yep. We are. I, I think you can. I. I don't think you have to have all that other study. I. I think you can still see that north of Clearwater is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I, so this is a very detailed study about redevelopment and how we can make uh, affordable housing 
be part of any redevelopment strategy right. here. So it's a very specific, right. uh, detailed plan. Um, we are starting our long range transportation plan and we are gonna be putting together a transit system plan or transit service plan, uh, working with PSTA on that. And so that easily ties into the Alt-19 corridor and looking at the increase to the frequency of the Jolly Trolley and other types of activities yeah. there. Um, and anytime we look at transit service, we want to like, how do you build that ridership in, whether right. it's tourism or not? Um, so those hubs are going to be pretty important. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. See no other questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on to uh, Wit, if you want to do the executive uh, director's report. Sure. Um, I've got a few items here, um, and I'll, I'll get through the ones that are less important quickly. Just on the spotlight emphasis area, our um, strategic uh, focus on different parts of Pinellas County, I wanted to make everybody aware that we do have a waterborne transportation committee meeting on March 15th. And uh, that committee uh, includes some members who are not currently on the board, uh, but were previously on the board, such as Mayor Kennedy and uh, Commissioner Susie Sofer of Bel Air Bluffs. If there's anybody who has an interest in waterborne transportation and would like to be um, at the committee meeting, I would certainly encourage you to be part of that discussion. Uh, Commissioner Albritton and Commissioner Long, or Councilmember Albritton and Commissioner Long, you're already on the committee and you're on the committee as well. Um, so we have good board representation, but if anybody else would like to volunteer, the meeting is uh, on the 15th. Tina, do you remember what time the meeting is? Or Christina? Waterborne committee? One o'clock, one o'clock on the 15th. And part of what we're gonna be doing at that meeting is reminding everybody what the restart plan was for, um, for the waterborne transportation system. Um, when it has been presented, um, I have heard various folks say, we've never been presented with a plan. We have a very specific plan for waterborne transportation, restarting it um, at the levels where it was operating in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, and then there is a phase two implementation that would cover more of the south uh, beaches area from Madeira, uh, Johns Pass, Treasure Island, places like that, and St. Pete Beach, potentially. Um, so uh, it will address the restart plan. It will also address some of the research we found in that Manatee County is starting a water taxi service. Um, we um, know that they are using some tourist development dollars for that. We are not sure how they are doing that. Uh, because we are aware that um, there's a, uh, a legal opinion here in Pinellas County that we cannot use tourist development dollars for capital or operating for the water taxi system. Um, but it may be eligible for some additional state funding and we've got a, a bead on some of that so we can talk a little bit about that at the committee meeting as well. I also wanted to let you all know, not so much in the spotlight area, but I think it, it's relevant. Uh, is the downtown St. Petersburg mobility study. Um, we finished that work up last year. Uh, we have since been working with the Florida Department of Transportation and they have done um, sort of a concept analysis of what we might be able to look at with the I-175 corridor and some modifications there. And they have uh, produced a, a short memo that outlines some potential alternatives that could be evaluated as part of a project development and environmental study. And you just heard the PD&E study for Gandhi Boulevard. So we are uh, looking to make a recommendation to this board and we'll bring it to you later in the spring to advance a PD&E study for the I-175 corridor in St. Petersburg that would look at a range of alternatives, including a no build, which is keeping the interstate as is, uh, but would also look at potentially creating more um, permeability um, underneath um, um, an elevated roadway that might allow the Campbell Park neighborhood to better connect with the uh, historic gas plant uh, district, and then potentially looking at a boulevard concept as well. Um, so those would all be evaluated in that. We'll, we'll give you a little more detail on that in the spring. I just wanted to let you know that the department has uh, provided that summary. Uh, we've, we've discussed it with the St. Pete Chambers Transportation Committee and we'll be maybe having a, a little bit more broad, broader conversation in the St. Petersburg community over the coming months. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just go into the legislative update. Uh, the legislative committee did not meet this morning because we didn't have a quorum, but I do wanna bring some bills to your attention. Uh, it's, you know, second day of, third day of the session, second day of the session, and some things are starting to happen. Uh, House Bill 1397 has been filed by Representative McClure and Senator Burgess, uh, which addresses regional transportation planning. Uh, however, this bill focuses on 
whether to uh, merge or um, um, remove uh, from existence uh, the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority and PSTA. Uh, the House bill directs FDOT to study whether both agencies should be dissolved, and the Senate bill only directs that uh, FDOT study uh, the potential merger and, um, and focus on HART. Um, the bills were newly filed and haven't been referred to any committee, so we'll see what traction there is. Uh, there is a Tampa Bay Times story that uh, appeared recently about that. Um, Senate Bill 588 um, um, also sponsored House Bill 657 by our Representative Coster uh, in the Oldsmar area um, would allow school districts to um, use uh, speed enforcement uh, mechanisms to ticket and warn drivers who are speeding through school zones. Uh, that's something that we've advocated for in the past um, and uh, they've been referred to three committees but uh, neither of these bills has had a hearing yet. Uh, just an update on the Senate Bill 64 by Senator Hooper. Um, that bill previously put a cap on the amount of public transportation dollars that could be spent from the state's public transportation or, or transportation trust fund. Uh, that cap has been removed uh, based on complaints uh, from around the state, particularly in South Florida. And you've heard my concerns about that as well. There's a housing bill, Senate Bill 102 uh, and House Bill 627 that has a number of provisions preempting local government's uh, ability to restrict height and density in their communities. So we talk about small town community character. Uh, this bill would, would, would remove your ability to do that in some cases. Um, if uh, there was a, an affordable housing project that was at least 40% affordable, you'd have to match the highest building within a mile of the jurisdiction. Um, and it also precludes local governments from um, actually approving it if, if the development met all your other criteria. So um, it would take some of the decision making out of local government hands. Uh, this is a priority of the Senate president and we've heard that no amendments will be considered to this bill. Uh, it doesn't even acknowledge the coastal high hazard area for instance. Um, we have another bill um, by Senator Brodeur um, and a House bill by Placencia. 882 and 885 respectively that would broaden the local government infrastructure surtax, the penny for Pinellas, and would allow funds to be spent on operating and maintenance, which currently is prohibited. Say that again. It would allow penny for Pinellas funds to be spent on operating and maintenance instead of just capital. On a future or um, I, I think it would probably be when it's renewed yeah, is my I guess. guess. Sorry, people have been told you can't just change. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could, but I, it wouldn't be very transparent. I think it would be very disruptive, and maybe yeah. it would just allow counties to make that choice. Yeah. And I imagine this county would not make that no. choice until renewal time. Yeah. Okay. So that's out there. Um, and then an interesting bill by Senator Brodeur, 740 in the Senate, uh, would also create a blue ribbon task force to look at county boundaries and realign county boundaries statewide. So they're not just stopping at the transit systems uh, or the MPOs, they're looking at county boundaries as well. Why do they care? I can't get into their heads on some of these things. So I don't know. I'll stay out of that one. Um, you know, there's, my experience is there's usually something that somebody did wrong in some county or local government somewhere that makes for sweeping change to everybody. Um, and I think that was the main thing. There are some other preemption bills of interest, um, and the Tampa Bay Times did a nice summary of, of those. Um, several of those bills are filed by our Senator DeSegli, so if you have concerns about that, uh, you may wanna um, consider reaching out to him. All right, up next is uh, 7C. You wanna take that one too? Yeah, this is an important one. I need an action on this one. Um, so um, we are in the process of beginning our procurement for an auditor. Uh, every year we have an audit of the uh, PPC and the MPO. They are separate audits. You'll be receiving those audits at the April uh, board meeting, the results of those audits. Uh, we, for the past year, used PSTA's auditor um, because we didn't have the time to, to get that ready last year. Uh, so we're beginning that process. So we'll be ready in September when we need to bring that aboard. Uh, I need a volunteer from this board to serve on the auditing committee and chair that committee it probably entails one or two um, evaluation committee meetings and reading four or five proposals that come in, however many come in, and making a recommendation to the full board. It shouldn't be a huge time commitment, but it might be you know, um, 
six to 10 hours of somebody's time over a period of a few months. Anybody willing to step up? We can't move forward without it. All right. Slaughter. <laughs> All right. It's really nice to have a volunteer who's actually in the room. <laughs> thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, I'll pull up to Tina. Is there any citizens that wish to be heard on this? I think we need to take an action to appoint um, Councilmember Burke. But do I need a citizens for? Yes, there okay. are. For the record, there are no citizens to be heard on this item. And yes, we need a motion and a second to accept the nomination and a vote of this board. Move approval. Second. I have a motion, a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. And all the pose, none. So passes. All right. Congratulations, council member. <laughs> um, all right. Moving on to the next uh, wit item 70. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll do this one quickly. The Advantage Pinellas Housing Action Plan uh, is part of the countywide housing compact that we are uh, spearheading in partnership with Pinellas County Government and the um, local um, committee uh, cities that are um, receiving housing funds, and that's Clearwater, St. Petersburg, Largo, and Pinellas Park, in addition to the county. Uh, we have a summit plan for April 28th. Um, it will be a, a pretty in, intensive call for action to address the affordable housing challenges that we have in this county. And um, I think you'll be pleased to know that um, we have um, been working with Pinellas County Administration and um, we feel that the Ford Pinellas Board would be an excellent vehicle for uh, supporting uh, and um, guiding the implementation of the housing compact because you all represent all 25 local governments uh, and you're a unique board that, that has that responsibility. Um, so what we will be doing is bringing a resolution to this board for uh, consideration and approval at your April meeting. Uh, the uh, Pinellas County government as the countywide planning authority will also be adopting the resolution and then we'll be asking the other local governments um, as partners in this effort to approve that resolution designating the Ford Pinellas board um, as the best entity to serve as an ongoing forum uh, for that effort. Um, so um, it's just a heads up for now. Uh, what we'll plan to do is every other meeting uh, is carve out some time on the agenda to either have a presentation or just to me to give you a report uh, on the progress that we're making. And, and I would uh, um, relate it to our Vision Zero Safe Streets Pinellas resolution where we've gotten most everybody to sign that and are continuing to keep Safe Streets Pinellas in the forefront on a regular basis. Does anybody have any questions about that? The action plan um, is coming along. Um, it is not going to be dictating anything to local governments, but it's gonna be creating um, sort of a menu of actions that we will be working with the local governments to implement. Uh, and uh, we really do wanna make this action oriented. I know St. Petersburg has done a lot of heavy lifting in this regard, and I think some of the other local governments have as well. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really trying to make sure that the actions um, fit the local government's ability to implement those things and choose from that menu. Um, but um, we could certainly consider looking at some of our criteria for funding and seeing how we can fold in affordable housing strategies as part of that criteria. All right, uh, moving on to information items. Do you have anything that you see? Um, no, really just what's in your packet um, and um, just some information about uh, fatalities, our Pinellas trail counts, uh, and the approvals that I've made as an executive director. Okay. Uh, we would like to have Secretary Gwen, who is here from the Florida Department of Transportation, give a brief announcement about moving Florida forward. Secretary, Secretary. thanks for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And um, this word has maybe gotten out a little bit, but not a lot, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew. So in the governor's budget this year, um, there was a Moving Florida Forward initiative, which was an investment in infrastructure. It listed 20 projects to be advanced in the work program. And uh, fortunately, one of those projects here in Pinellas County. So under the governor's budget, there was about $354 million in fiscal year 25, which is only 18, 16 months from now, um, to take the express lanes on Interstate 275 from the Howard Franklin Bridge through the Gateway Project all the way down to 38th North. 
So I just want to make sure everybody knew that. That's in there. It seems like it's getting a lot of momentum. And so uh, that's something we, I know, in, at one time, WIT had that funded, and we lost the funding somehow. But it looks like in fiscal year 25, that will be back into the uh, budget if the governor's budget's approved. So just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. We think that's very positive for, uh, for, for Pinellas County. Thank you. Right. Any members have a question relating to this? Thank you, Secretary. Thank you. I, I, while you're up here, Secretary, just maybe a question for you, or at least a heads up for the board members. Our priority for that project include bringing those managed lanes down to 375. I know that's not part of this amount of money put aside, but that's still being designed and all the way down to 54th Avenue South is my understanding. So what can you say about maybe a phase two at some point? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but. Yes, yeah, so we, we really want to try to keep pushing that further to the south. There is a piece of right of way that's required right at CSX crossing. And unfortunately, uh, over the years, CSX actually sold a piece of that underneath there to a business, so we have another party to, to work with. But um, the intent would be to continue to move that further south um, and fully fund it. But this is, uh, this is a good first start. And then uh, while, while we're working on this one, it's already in design. We hope to, we'll, we'll be letting it to construction within a couple of years. We'll continue to move the rest of it forward. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, upcoming events. Uh, there are a couple really good ones coming up. Uh, like you heard one, uh, Biker City in Oldsmar. Um, please spread the word. It, it's the, this, was it Friday? Friday, yeah, Friday. Um, so if you have your bike and wanna get out and get some fresh air, get up to Oldsmar and uh, see their, their city and their trails and everything and uh, enjoy that, that time up there. Uh, that's this Friday, March 10th. The other is the two um, MPO AC meetings, our events. If you haven't signed up, um, like most of us, we've, you've heard, we've done that. Um, it is a really cool experience to do and very informative. So if you have the opportunity or not, it's not already booked up, do, take, take an opportunity to do that. Um, you'll learn a whole lot. Uh, and, and at the same time, you get to build relationships with uh, other members to understand uh, what's going on. So, and that's it. All right, good for the board and adjournment. Thank you.